Hi, welcome to Chair Chats, the lifestyle talk show with a disability twist. I'm your host, Pauline Victoria. There's not much we can count on in this life, but there is one thing we can be sure of, and that is change. Change is hard to embrace for many of us because it requires us to step into uncertain circumstances that makes us feel vulnerable. Dr. Kimberly Barrington knows all about change. Her life was turned upside down with life-threatening circumstances, but she knew she had a choice in understanding who she was going to be in the face of change. We're going to get into her story on this episode, but before we do that, I want to remind you to please subscribe and share, and I'd like to invite you to my Facebook groups, primarily Crip Chat Club via Zoom, where we meet every Saturday to have real talk in the disability community. I'd also like you to show the love if you like what you see here at patreon.com forward slash One Leg Up Productions. excited to have you on my show, Dr. Kimberly. You are a force and an energy that I just want to be a part of. Like, I'm sad that this is over Zoom. I just like, like, if COVID wasn't here, I'd want to just hook up next to you and be like, okay, talk to me and make me smile. That is your energy. And I am so happy to have you here because we got a chance to talk together. And you told me your story. And if I had to judge you by your story, your personality is not what would come out. And I love the, the, like the uh, opposition there. Right. Um, And I know our listeners don't know the story yet. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to tell your story and how you went from the the struggles the obstacles the hardships of the of your story to who you are now which is someone who's so bright and full of life and oh gosh i i could literally i'm speechless with your energy so i am going to take a a pause for me and i'm going to let you talk and let our audience get to know you a little bit more Well, hello, everyone. My name is Kimberly. And for those that irritate me, uh, my first name is Doctor. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, don't let the wheelchair fool you. You know, just, I I like doing that sometimes. I'll be like, oh my goodness, can I, is there anything I can do? Can I help you? Um, so what is your name? And maybe we should start there. I said, my name is Dr. Kimberly Barrington. Oh, really? Yes. Now, how may I help you? Because I can do this by my own self. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's so great. I love it. <laughs> you know, don't, don't, don't placate me. Really? Oh. Yeah. So... I am 54 years old. And beautiful. Thank you. I appreciate that. I am the mother of three, a pair and a spare, twins that are 33, and a single that is 26. And from them, I have 6.0 grandchildren, one on the way. So that, that means I'll be a grandmother of seven. I love it. I love every minute of it. I am a wife. And I enjoy that too. I actually do laundry and cook. <laughs> All from my wheelchair. Yes, I do. And so uh, I, I just, I enjoy my life. Uh, by definition, the prefix on disabled means the ability not to do. And so if that's the case, I was born disabled because I was born African-American and I was born a female. Wow. (laughs) And so I had to make a decision 
early on of who was who am I going to be in the midst of all that. I am a United States Navy veteran. I am a domestic violence survivor. I am a cancer survivor a couple of times. And uh, I've been homeless. And I have come out on the other side. And I am in this small group called, I think it's called Black Privilege. Yeah, I thought that was kind of funny when my son told me, yeah, you, mom, really? You, you, you have Black Privilege. <laughs> And I had to laugh about that one. And so I looked it up and I said, I guess so. But what really makes it even more unique is the fact that I am disabled. I am hearing impaired, visually impaired. Yeah, so that right eye, I don't see out of it. It's just there to be cute. <laughs> Hold up my eyelash and give symmetry to my face. Yes. And I have this rare bone disease. It's called fibrosis mental dysplasia where I get these lesions they don't know why and uh, I have three I still have one left I'm not ready yet for the third one to be removed I'm still recovering from the first two so the first one when I had the surgery they cut from my ear all, all the way down to the front part of my jaw took out most of the jaw and I said oh well now that whole side matches because I've had five head surgery well I lost all my hair and um, had to have five head surgeries and wow. So half of my head on the right side is, is gone. But God is good because it still looks a little symmetrical. Just like, you know, when I hold my head down, you can say, oh, oh yeah, now I know this. And I have a big long scar that starts from the front all the way to the back. And I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm, I'm okay because I could have been gone. And then, um, wow, I've had thyroid cancer and had to have surgery for that. So as a matter of fact, in 2013, I had my fifth head surgery in April, found out I had thyroid cancer in May, had surgery in June, and three months later, I had a stroke, which left me in a wheelchair. Talk about change. And Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I think it was during, it was like the third or fourth head surgery. And I felt like I, I just can't take this anymore. After the third head surgery, I started having seizures. I got really down about it. And I didn't think that I would make it to the, to the fourth nor to the fifth one. And um, I didn't like the way I looked just going through the process of one, having lost all of my hair on all of my body because of an autoimmune disease. And um, wow, I think it's taking me to a, um, some of an emotional place when I think about all that I've gone through and I'm still here. And nine months into almost into the COVID, and I'm still here, COVID free. There are those who who have died, and we've watched their struggle through television. And um, I guess that's why it's important that you have to choose who are you going to be in the midst of all of this. And I just remember looking at myself and asking God to, to just really help me. I said, I don't, I don't, I don't think I could do this. Not another day. I just, I don't think I can do this, God. He says, you don't have to. He said, cause I have you. And my son had a game, he plays football. He had a game coming up and I didn't have the heart to look him in his face and tell him, I just, I can't do this anymore. And it's just out of the clear blue sky, I could just hear so plainly, God said that no matter how you feel, you need to get up, dress up, 
never give up. And you need to show up. I said, what? <laughs> he said, yeah, no matter how you feel, because it's not about how you feel. You got to get up, you got to dress up, never give up, and you got to show up because somebody's going to need your story. And I, I was like, whoa. And at that time, I've been wearing, you know, I wear, I've been wearing lashes since like 1992. And in that moment, I decided to start a lash company. And that was the model. No matter how you feel, get up, dress up, never give up and show up for life because somebody needs your story. But when you show up, you need to show up in lashes like Kayvon. So <laughs> I love it. Yes. They don't show up, child, put your bass lashes on and some lip gloss and let's go. <laughs> Yes. And if you're going to show up, show up as the best version of yourself. In that moment, I decided who I was going to be. I, I was going to show up in life and I was going to look my very best. And because I didn't like the, I mean, purple has always been my favorite color, but because I didn't like how I looked, you know, a, a woman is known by her beauty with her hair and how she's, you know, so ornately adorned. And I didn't feel that. I said, I don't have any hair in my, half of my head is gone. I spent most of this time in stitches. I had more than a hundred stitches every time. And they were doing surgeries every six months. So you don't really have enough time to heal from the first surgery and it's time for the next one. And so I, I always felt like I was in this perpetual state of looking like some sort of monster. <laughs> mm. Yeah. And, um, you know, with an ill-shapen head as they were doing the surgeries, the scarring, just, just the way that it looked. And, um, but I would get up and put some lashes on though. And I found the cutest little hats. I went to Walmart. And they had these hats that were like $2. These cute little knit hats had them in different colors. And my grandmother had just passed away like the year before my first head surgery. And she had all this antiquated jewelry. And of course, nobody thought to get it. I went and got it. And I took it apart and I started sewing it to the hats. And, and I would put the hat on. Of course, I had to have you know special covering for the, the scarring and, you know, during that time. But it was awesome to feel like I had her enveloping me. That is beautiful and so innovative. Like, it, I think one of the keys to a, a pro, embracing change with grace is to accept things as they are and then figure out how how do I adapt to it? And that's a word you used also in our com in a prior conversation is adapt. Um, yeah. Change is going to happen, whether it's on the micro level where like you, you, it was personal, it was your health. Um, and change could happen on a larger scale, like on the macro. <laughs> like yes. Yeah. Change is inevitable, but how we respond to that change makes makes all the difference and you said earlier that when you were a child you had to make a decision early on mm -hmm. you go into that a little bit what was that decision and do you feel like that decision carried through your whole life while you experienced other changes I was um, raped repeatedly by family members, it was two in particular. And there were so many young women who because of that got addicted to drugs and alcohol at a young age, become ex became extremely promiscuous. And I made the decision, I was not gonna allow what happened to me to define me in that manner. I was not gonna do that at all. So, my addiction became God and church. That's a good addiction. It's a good alternative. <laughs> it is. And, and you know, in, in some ways, it, it can be negative. 
in, in, in some aspects, you know? I mean, because we can take anything and make it negative. We can take the very best thing and, and make it negative. So I think that um, you can probably go a, a, a little overboard, but that was my decision. And so I made the, cho the choice early on to be a very sober-minded person regardless of what was happening to me, around me, and through me. And did it go bad for you, your, you know, addiction to God and church? Or did you keep it on the positive side? Um, I think there were some very great areas. Okay. Some very great areas. Because anytime you experience something like that, one of the things that comes out is become a, a people pleaser. Ah, oh, yes. You, you very much so become a, a people pleaser and you get addicted to needing to be needed and finding ways to be indispensable, whether it is to protect yourself or just to be accepted. I, I, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so if someone was listening to that right now, and they could relate to that. I can relate to that, right? It becomes like a codependency. I had to make, again, it was making that decision. And when I saw it, and I think probably where it really whew, came to fruition for me was I was at a church and I was being physically abused by my husband and I went in several times to talk to the pastor about it and his response was not very positive it it, it, it wasn't you know and I just remember his wife saying to me because she sat in on each of the counseling sessions when I would go in I even went in with my children at, at the, you know, when it got to its worst and they said, please help us. You know, we, we begged for help and it, they just didn't want to do that because they didn't want to cause a ripple effect. And his wife, the pastor's wife, she just said, if anybody can get through this, it's you. You have such a strong constitution and what you can look forward to is that you will be able to bless somebody else and help them out of the situation. You know, God always needs to use somebody to go through something, to be the example so that they can bring others out. I'm like, I don't want to be used by God like that. <laughs> I'm just like, little lady, look, lady, lady, look. Mm. Well, and in order to inspire other people to leave a situation that's not healthy for them, you have to leave the situation. Right. It's not about staying in a situation. You, yeah. You know, but it was, and, and I just remember I had found, I mean, and what made this so crazy is that I thought I had an out because I found out that the wife that he was married to prior to me when we got ready to, cause we both were veterans or are veterans. And when we got ready to put each other on each other's cases for dependence, the VA came back and said, well, he's still married to the other lady. And I was like, what? Yeah, so hold on. Then they called back and said, no, well, they did get a divorce but they weren't divorced when the two of you got married. So your marriage isn't valid and you guys have to get remarried again. And I was like, oh my God, yes, this was my out. So I went to my pastor and I said, yes, this is my out. And he was like, oh well, no, if, if you have to redo it, you're gonna redo it. I was like, uh, no, I'm not doing this. I said, God answered my prayer. I felt like, you know, hey, this, this, this is my way out. And he was like, no, 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 because you guys, have already made plans. Everybody's been engaged. I was like, ask me if I care. I don't care how much money has been put into doing this. 
I'm ready to be done. I have an opportunity and I got a legal way to get out. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and um, he was still adamant about me getting married to him. And again, being that people pleaser, it's like, okay, you know, I don't want to be ostracized, you know, out of my church. And So I think you're not alone in that. Like we often live our lives based on the opinion of others and how they'll accept us and the, mm-hmm. and the, and the lines we need to stay in in order for them to see us as acceptable. And apparently you've made the crossover to a place where it was more important that you accepted yourself, that you cared about yourself more than what other people said about you. How did you get there? When, after we got married again, and um, my aunt had died. Yeah. He didn't come to the funeral. And I spent the day with my family. And I came home. And he beat me until both my eyes were swollen shut. I couldn't even see. And my son was 11 at the time, I think. I believe he was 11. And he tried to save me because he had a knife to my throat. I had some pearls that my aunt, the one who died had given me and he had cut them off of me. And my son was like, I can't. He tried to come in and save me. He grabbed him, put the knife to his throat and told him if he ever tried to save him, save me again from him, that he would kill him. And I knew that I'm done. That's I don't need to be accepted by anybody. Right. Especially if your it, child's life is on the that's, line. I, I don't need your acceptance. I do not need it at all. And when my son, where we lived, was half a mile away from one of the largest colleges or universities that we have here. And So where we were, the police and the ambulance would would hang out in different parking lots together, chit-chatting, you know, waiting for calls just to see what, especially on the weekend, kids get crazy, get drunk, do dumb stuff. So they they frequented the main street over from, from where we lived. And I just, my son led me by my hand down the street. I couldn't see, my eyes were so on shut, I mean, bleeding, nail, I mean, you see, I, I have long nails and the nails had been ripped off at the nail bed. So my hands were bleeding, you know, defensive wounds. We didn't see right away a police or, you know, the ambulance. And my son said, just sit right here. I don't even know where we were. I just know he sat me on somebody's stoop and he said, mom, I just sit right here. I'll be right back. You're going to be okay. And he found them and they came and got me and put me in the ambulance. They were trying to take my statement and they immediately went to arrest him. And, and that, that was my moment. That was my moment because I went to church after I got out of the hospital. And of course, you know, I had on sunglasses. And after church, the pastor was like, you tough. It looks like, you know, you you tried to give as good as you got. So you hung in there. 
And then his wife was like, oh, it just looked that bad. I'm sure that, you know, after all that, you still going to be pretty, though. I think you will. You'll be okay. And I was just like, whoa. 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 And they told, so when the sentencing came, they told me to write the letter. I said, I'm not writing the letter on his behalf. And my pastor at that time was a VP of a very large company here. And he wrote it as the VP first and then as a pastor to the judge and said that the church is going to embrace us and that they're going to minister us back to health and that the church had this awesome men's program and said all the things that they would do as a ministry and to let him go. He deserved a second chance. And the judge said, he's a repeat offender. I saw what she looked like. He says, and I'm just going to say this. If you put your hands on her again and your case lands in my courtroom, I'm giving you 25 to life. He said, and not even God himself can come down and save you. And I mean that. And for someone to think that much of me was pivotal because nobody had ever fought for Kim and stood behind Kim like that and said, you know what? This is the consequence if you do something to her again. I had never had anybody stand up for me like that. And in that moment, it was like, yes. I'm not going to let anybody think more of me than what I should be thinking about me. And so when I ended up in the wheelchair and everyone uh, asked the proverbial question, who did sin? What did you do wrong? You know, I was just like, let me tell you something. I was more crippled by what people thought about me before I ever got in a wheelchair. So I said, I am so healed right now. Let me tell you, I said, my healing came in my mind, in my body, in my spirit, and in my very soul. Because this right here is just, just to remind me, yeah, mm -hmm, he did that thing for Kim. Yes, he did. Yeah. Wow. That is so beautiful. I think we get, and it's easy. And, and I understand having to operate in a world that you obviously don't belong in, you know, physically or attitudinally. Um, but oftentimes what your story illustrates to me is that there are worse disabilities in our minds and in our spirits that we need to heal those, those heart wounds. Absolutely. And, um, and, and I tell people all the time that I am more healed than you ever will be walking around as, as I am in this wheelchair. I said, trust and believe. And I said, because when I was up walking around, nobody cared that I was depressed, that I had anxiety that I attempted suicide, that I was on lithium because the depression was so bad. I couldn't even function. I mean, I felt so badly for my children because when, they, when you come in the home, it's like, oh, they're outside, it's bright, it's wonderful. And when they come home, every single window was covered with the heaviest quilt or blanket that I had because I was just that depressed. Yeah. But nobody ever talked to me. No one ever considered that a disability, that I was just that disabled. 
that I could not function. If I came out, I had on sunglasses because just the very light of outside hurt my eyes. Because in my home, it was dark. I was dark. Yeah. Yeah. And years later to our present time. Look at that smile. Look at that smile. Yes. Oh my God. You not only like your smile, but your eyes brighten, just light up and everything about you is just illuminated. And that, I, like, again, like I said, I'm speechless because some stories, I love how Maya Angelou says people, you'll always forget what people said, but you'll never forget how they made you feel. Absolutely. And the way you make people feel sometimes is not expressed in words. It's just something you have to experience. So I hope that our audience is getting to experience a little bit mo uh, more about you. And if you guys haven't already um, known about Dr. Kimberly Barrington, she actually hosts her own show and she is a <laughs> fabulous show host. Fabulous. <laughs> I swear, like Oprah, move over. Like this is this girl, this woman just knows what it takes and if you're interested in checking out her show rolling on the road is there anything you want to say about your show here so i love it it started because i wanted to know what was going to happen with all the advocacy things that i had done in the community now that we have to socially distance and i said you know, we argued about things being accessible now. I'm like, oh my goodness. Now nobody can go to work. <laughs> and I said, you know, I mean, one of the things that happened for me immediately after I had the stroke was, where did all my friends go? No one invited me anywhere. And just the first time that I had to say, yeah, well, I want to go. They're like, oh, we got to take you in the wheelchair? And well, how does that work? And yeah, you know, well, I can't help you lift it up because, you know, I can't do all that. Well, I wasn't really able to do all of that. It took me a while before I had the, the body strength to lift myself up those stairs and to be able to get the wheelchair up. Oh, my goodness. That's a, that's a whole nother show, whole nother, yeah, that's a whole nother Right, story. right. But um, it was the socially, being ostracized, I guess that's the best way I can say it, you know, mm. and the depression that came with that, not feeling like I had a place, Ooh, a lot of emotions. I mean, but people are feeling it now. I see it on social media is feeling the social isolation, not being able to interact with others. And I just said, wow, now you know what it feels like to be disabled. You know, I said, now the whole world can, can feel it. They're experiencing it. And there was an article that came out, I want to say like April, yeah, it came out like late April, mid late April in Forbes, and it talked about COVID 19 being the perfect disability social model. It's where now everyone else can get to feel what it's like to be socially isolated and to need special accommodation, and it's not there for you. And that was how the show got started because I called some people that I felt we need to have this conversation. It's like, yes, it's a great conversation starter. And everyone's apathy. Like, how dare you ask us right now? There's so many things going on and you want to talk about advocacy and, and have a town hall meeting. And I got no responses. And then five weeks had gone by and I was livid because I said, you know, every single time I have been asked to show up, to do, to be, I was there. And now I ask you 
just to do a quick live with me that might last an hour, if that, and I'm getting no response. And so God just said to me, why are you getting upset? I didn't go to all of them. I came to you. I gave you the idea. You go live all the time. Everybody always tells me, you know, the queen of going live. If you look at any of my pages, my personal page, <laughs> or you go to, you know, my public figure page, or you can even go over to Miss Wheelchair, Michigan, USA. All of them, wherever I am, it's like I would go live and say, hey, you know what? I'm at the zoo today. I'm going to tell you something. This, this, and this is accessible. This, this, and this is not. These are the following accommodations they did make. These are the ones that they looked at me like, how dare I even ask the question? And so I basically have been doing this anyway. And so I said, you know what, girl, you, you got this. You, you're, you're good at it. And the day before, I would say two days before I got ready to do it, one person called and said, I apologize. And I said, really? For what? I can't <laughs> imagine. What happened? What's going on? <laughs> it's like, she's so sarcastic, mm, so condescending. Girl, bring it back. I'm like, okay, hello, how are you? Hold on just a minute. <clears throat> I gotta go get the other Kim, right? That Kim, mm -mm, don't talk to her. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't talk to her. She, she the naughty one. <laughs> don't talk to the naughty Kim. <laughs> so I had to go get the professional Kim. You know, Dr. Kimberly had to come out. So hold on one second. Let me go get her. This is Dr. Kimberly Barrington. How can I help you today? Oh, I just wanted to tell you that let's just go for it. Let's let's just do what we know. And I was like, um, hold on. I was like, <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm back. Okay, sure. So what is your availability? Hey, I can do Tuesdays and Thursdays. Let's do four to five and let's just see how it goes. We did the first show May 7th and yeah, probably reached, I think what is it, you know, they have give you all these little numbers, probably had like 500 views that first show reached like 1200. It's amazing. It really is. Um, and I know on uh, this particular episode, um, you're we're bringing it down to something a little bit more serious and I, i'm so grateful for you being vulnerable with with us so that you can actually help people through their struggles and situations uh, <laughs> yeah but some places i haven't visited in a long time and i'm just astonished because you don't realize how far you've come until you look back at where you were yeah. and I'm looking at myself and I'm sitting there oh my gosh girl I wake up every day and I say you are so pretty girl yes you are you are so beautiful and I expect great things out of you today wow that is amazing. Even no, I, that, I expect great things from you today. Wow. And I look at what I say to myself today that I didn't say to myself yesterday. And now my tolerance level for if you're not loving me being a part of team kim and i don't mean that in a narcissistic way i mean that when you know what you've been called to do and you know what your purpose is you don't tolerate things people places and spaces in your purpose area you know you're very intentional about the relationships that you have you're very intentional about what you watch what you eat um, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically. Uh, you really monitor how your time is being spent. So I solve problems for a living. 
every day, all day. So if you don't want to be out of what you're in or do something different, then I, I'm not going to waste my time. And one of the things that has happened is that my discernment has become so keen, so, so keen that I know when people, sometimes they want to just come in my space because they need my energy. Mm -mm, you don't get to do that anymore. Oh, that's you need to go and do the work yourself. And when you start like Dorothy, get on that yellow brick road and somewhere in there, I'm, I, I might come and I might be Toto and be like, woo, 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 let's go. Woo, woo, woo. You know, I may come and just be like the tin man. Scree, scree. Come on. Cause you know, he could sing a good song and do a good little. <laughs> so, you know, I might sing a little song to you and I might do a little tap dance. And sometimes I make, you know, be the scarecrow and say, look, I, mm -mm, you ain't got no brains. Hold on. Let's get that. Let's, let's get that straw out your brain. Okay. Or I might be the lion and just, you know, I can give you a little bit of my courage. Come on, let's go. We can get on this road. But you need to get on the yellow brick road first before I can come along. That's, so, I mean, that that's one of probably the biggest lessons that I've learned is once you get something for yourself, you're so excited, you want everybody to do it. We do that. Like, I like boss water. So now all of a sudden, everybody in my family want to go get some boss water. Girl, can I come get some boss water? Yeah, that's wonderful. Or, oh, my cousin, she was the person who found all the great drinks and all the great candies. So <laughs> she found Snapple and then she found these wonderful little candies that were like a, like the little starlight, except for they have flavors. You could get strawberry, you could get orange and they tasted like a push-up. Remember those popsicles put the push-up? Mm -hmm. uh, the candy was just a bomb. So that's what she just in our family, she was known to find all the good snacks, all the good drinks, and got everybody on board. And so we just said, yes, you know, so we hang out with her to find out what the next new snack and drinks was going. <laughs> it's like you, yeah. she get good snacks. And it's the same way when people see that you're good at something or you've overcome something or you have this great synergy that you possess. Because normally synergy is having two, three, four, five folks that come along together that work really well. There are some people that possess their own synergy because they've navigated really well in so many different areas of their life. And now it's all come together and they just, ooh, they can own it. And you're like, I need some of that or I want some, but guess what? You know, so if everyone comes to you with an empty cup, <laughs> then you end up being drained. But the wonderful thing about synergy is that you're bringing something to, to keep adding to it. Mm. You know, you, you, you're, you're going to bring something to keep adding to it. And so I've learned very quickly that if you're not adding something to the synergy, you know, some people... I like sippy cups. So if you come to me and you bring me a sippy cup, I will fill it up with whatever you need me to fill it up with. Because that cup to me, you know, a sippy cup is empty and they're usually kind of big. They got a nice straw where you can just, just enjoy. And oh my God, if it's purple, it might have some sparklies on it. <laughs> gonna be your friend forever so it's like if you send me a purple sippy cup because um i did have to put my address on there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so if i get a purple sippy cup with some glitter on it from you girl you can call me at midnight and i'll wake up and be like good morning with your knee girl you need me to mm. yes <laughs> all right ladies and gentlemen you heard it here a purple sparkly bedazzled sippy cup 
<laughs> is, the heart, is the way to Dr. Kimberly's heart. <laughs> I'm serious. Well, you know what? So we, we're going to take that a step further because that means that you consider me, and I'm, I'm going to give you the secret to that, because now you consider me a whale from which you want to draw from. There's the bow. It's so it good. Yeah. That you consider me a whale and you want to come and drink from the whale. And the thing with sippy cups, though, you have to open it in order to fill it up. And I think you made a really good point that I just want to emphasize for our audience is that you could, people say they want change, they say they want out but they're not ready to take that step into onto the yellow brick road, like you said, or they're not willing to open up the sippy cup in order for you to fill. Other, if you just filled it without opening it, it's just going all over the place and, and has no purpose. Um, and so part of accepting change with grace, and sometimes we have to be the catalyst for that change. And that's yeah. uncomfortable. And yeah. We have to know that that we need that extra courage or that somebody that, to come alongside us to help us create that change. But it has to start with a, a genuine desire for that change too. Absolutely. Yeah. Because a lot of people come, but it's like, oh, I have to do some work. Absolutely. You, you know, and, I, and I, I love you. See, that's what I'm saying. We could just be together forever because you caught it. You first have to open up in order to receive. Yeah. And yeah. all this fabulousness you see here, guys, her, me, like that did not just happen. You heard Dr. Kimberly's story. It, no one would raise their hand and be like, I want to walk that story. So to get where she is, to get where I am, it requires work. We did the work. Um, we, we walked that yellow brick road. We opened up the, that sippy cup and, you know, they're probably amazing people in your life, but it sounds like a lot of that was God filling it up for you because I love what you said earlier that you were saying to God, I can't do this. I can't do it for one more day. And he said, you don't have to, cause I got you. And I, you know, I, I know not everyone shares these beliefs. Um, I'm a believer though. I, and my faith has been, uh, been center to where, how I've, how I am and who I am. And so knowing that you don't have, you're not alone. And, and when we're, we're, when we're emptied, like there's, mm -hmm. there's, there's more that we can ask for and asking for that help, right. During that change or being that change. Oh, so important. And I didn't even, you know, I didn't even see this coming when I was looking at doing this show on how do we show up and who do we say we are in the face of change, but also knowing that we can be the catalyst of change. I did not see that coming. So thank you for bringing that out into this episode because I think right now even with the way things are there there are many of us that say no there has to be change and this is okay this these are the growing pains right now yes yes and I think that it's interesting that I think Dave Bukowski says it best um, and that's who co-hosts with me on Tuesdays and Thursdays and he said, it's easy to take a stone and throw it in a calm water and make a ripple. He goes, it's another thing to throw a stone in tumultuous water and make it be steel. And I was just like, what? And I probably didn't even say it exactly the way that he says it. And I said, what do you mean by that? He said, that's you, you're the stone. He says, you are probably the only person that I know that can just drop in the middle of something that's already rippled and make it stand still and make it pay attention to you. And then wow. you speak. And I just was like, 
I know we could go on forever, but I do want to make another plug for your show rolling on the road because like, this is good stuff. This is good stuff that anybody, whether you have a disability or not, whether it's dis- dis- a disability that's physical or a disability in your mindset or your spirit, this is universal principles that Dr. Kimberly Barrington is sharing with us right now. And uh, like, this is stuff that fills me up and I get lit up and excited about. Um, so if you want to absorb more of the wisdom and the fire that is Dr. Kimberly Barrington, go check out her on Facebook, Rolling on the Road. Um I know I'm like promoting your show more than I promote mine. So I <laughs> obviously we, we call them shameless plugs. Uh, so, but I, I do appreciate it. And I thank you. And it's nice to be the guest and not have to be the host. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? I, I know I was going to say shameless plug, but I am starting to take that word out. I, you know what we, this is a plug. We are here. Our businesses, Dr. Kimberly are here to serve people. Absolutely. And, and Absolutely. that's a, what a beautiful way of being of service in this world. So we're going to plug it all out there. <laughs> I did an interview with a young lady. I love her. Oh my gosh. She's in Bel Air, Maryland. And um, she know if she sees this, she knows I'm talking about her. I love you. <laughs> and we did a show, her, well, her show for that particular day was about finding love with a disability. And I said to her that the principles that I'm going to give have absolutely nothing to do with the state of your body, but what is the state of your mind? Because regardless of your able-bodied or disabled body, that the mind is what's the most important and how we see things and how we choose to live our lives and, and, you know, our own personal perspectives and what we bring to that. And I said, I definitely have to say that I am a hopeless romantic because I think a lot of people would say, oh my gosh, I don't know that I would ever get married after experiencing something so horrible. But it's like, you know, we all make choices and um, I wasn't going to allow the abuse to perpetuate by not allowing me to love again. Oh, beautiful. I'm not going to perpetuate that. You, you don't get to take up that much space. So that's why I just don't understand when someone says, oh, I hate them and oh, I can't stand them. But at one point, you probably did some things that you don't want even your mama or God to know about because you love that person. And now all of a sudden, because it's gone badly, you, you just want to curse the very day that, that their mother and father got together. How dare you? Because you do you ever think about what maybe you have done to someone else and they may feel that way about you? You know, we, we never know the effects that we have on someone. Even if it's not in a personal male and female or female and female, male, male, whatever it is that you like, I'm not getting into all of that. I'm just saying, just in, in relationships that you never know what you may have done to cause the other person damage. So you need to really stop and think about that sometimes, you know, why you, you're carrying all this. And I promise you that is crippling as well. And that will disable you in so many areas. And if you think I'm disabled, if I start telling you about some, my, my everyday and you're looking at my friend over here, well, she don't have irons. Honey, you don't have none either because you can't reach nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and I, I love, uh, I saw the movie Soul Surfer, which is based on Bethany Hamilton's story, the one who got bit by a shark and her lost her arm at 13 in Kauai. And I saw her movie and she said, um, someone had asked her, well, do, would you, if you could have your arm back, would you? And she said, I can hold more hearts with one arm than I ever could with two. 
So imagine with no arms, people, I can hold so many hearts. <laughs> and, you know, and I have to say, if I could go back to age 47, which was seven years ago, and do something different to prevent having a stroke, I don't know that I would. Yeah. I like the person that I have become. And if the stroke pushed me to become who I am, then I have to love it and embrace it. If having the five head surgeries has pushed me to be who I am today, then I embrace that. If being born without sight in my right eye has caused me to have such great insight, then I wouldn't want that to be changed. You know, if not having my hearing has caused me to hear better with my heart, then I wholeheartedly embrace these hearing aids. If being in this chair has caused me to roll across this country in and in and out of so many people's lives, I would rather have that than to have only walked from here to the mailbox. Oh my gosh, so, goosebumps. And if all of this, even from a child up to this point, has allowed me to lay at the feet of Jesus, have him Hold me close to his heart. Mm. Yeah. And have his ear hearken to every time I open up my mouth to him. I would not want to change that. I Amen. wouldn't. Amen. I, would not, I wouldn't want to change that. And when I see how I'm able to make the difference and improve the quality of others lives because of what has happened to me I wouldn't change it for me. Right. because we've been taught so many things and we see now how a lot of the things that we've learned we need to unlearn because they're not doing anything to help us right now through this pandemic I I've had people say oh I can't wait till we go back to the way things used to be. And I said, name me three things that were just so wonderful that you want to go back to. Well, I said, I'll wait. Yeah. Were things as good as you remember them? Because it's amazing how when we talk about yesterday, yesterday just seemed like it was so wonderful. But when you were in it, it was the worst hell you'd ever been in. Right. When did, what happened that it changed? All of a sudden the memories, you know, when we talk about it, it's like, oh my God. You know, you find it when, when people's spouses pass away. And I'm not saying this for everybody, but trust and believe, some folks was waiting on the day that you was getting ready to be gone. Cause society says, well, I shouldn't, you know, get divorced. My church says I shouldn't be divorced. My mom said don't get divorced. My daddy said and my cousin and them, you know, but I'm just going to stick and stay. The Lord Jesus, if you have any, you know, just. <laughs> right. Well, and you know <laughs> what you just. Girl, I'm just saying stuff that you don't want to say out loud. <laughs> and I didn't earn the right to say out loud. I didn't been through enough stuff. I, I just say it. And I don't care if you don't like me, because guess what? All this right here is just you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know what you just pointed to, and again, I just want to emphasize that for people who are watching this, is that it's hard to hate the things that made you become who you are. And, you know, as hard as it is in the moments that you're going through it, or months or years of whatever the struggle is you're experiencing right now, it is forming you into who you will become. It's only after we get out, like when, when we're out of the dark, 
that we can see how like where how it created and formed us into who we are today and like you I would not I was I've been asked that question over and over throughout my life if I could change my body to be able-bodied would I and I'm not gonna lie I recognized how things would be easier but I would not be who I am today nor would I be doing what I'm doing today right change is something we could resist or we can embrace And when we are able to embrace it from a place of empowerment, then we are able to set ourselves up for growth and set set ourselves up for gratitude. And that is so important um, for our, not just survival, but for what I believe we came on this planet for. And I love how you said earlier that when you're, you, you know your purpose, you're very cognizant of how you spend your time, who you let in your circles, mm-hmm. and you would not be fulfilling this purpose had you not gone through all those changes and all those struggles. Yeah. And I want to thank you for oh, thank you. being like going through it and being willing to be changed by it for the better. I say going through with style and grace and a smile on my face. Oh, I love it. I love it. Yes. Okay. So we're going to end that there. I want to also en- encourage you to check out Rolling on the Road. Um, I'm going to yeah. quote you on that and put that in the show notes and people can put it up on a post-it in their mirror every time they look on, look at it and they're having a hard day. Well, I want to hear from our viewers. Do you embrace or resist change? And if you found a strategy that works for you, I'd love for you to share it. And with our community, um, we can help each other. And we're here to support one another and to be on that journey together. You're not alone and you are becoming this beautiful butterfly as you're going through the dark times. So thank you for tuning in. I want to remind you to please subscribe and share. And if you'd like to join my Facebook groups, you can do that. They're called Crip Chat Club via Zoom. And we meet every Saturday as a disability community where we just have real talk and share over our experiences. And I'd also like you to show us some love if you like what you see here on One Leg Up Productions and you would like to see more, support us at patreon.com forward slash One Leg Up Productions. Thank you so much for tuning in and until we meet again, be blessed. Okay, I'm gonna stop it here.